green chemistry's role in sustainability. So we already talked about the definition of sustainability, I have to confess. I like um, the way I kind of paraphrase it, preserving what you can't live without and preserving it forever. Okay. So sustainability is a centuries-long perspective. The decisions you make are, are not short-term. It's not about the next financial quarter. It's, a, it's not about the next election cycle. It's about centuries, you know, decades and centuries. So if you were a resource planner and you were planning in 1914 what 2014 needed to look like, you would make sure that you had enough whale oil for lighting. You would make sure that you had enough wood for fuel. You'd certainly want to have enough rock salt for refrigeration, and you better beef up on the horses for transportation because those horseless carriages things are never going to take off. Okay, what actually happens? These are the charts where the land used to feed horses peaked at 89 million acres uh, to less than 3 million in 1961 when they stopped keeping the records because it was irrelevant and useless. This is the uh, wood used as fuel. Uh, these are all from Department of Commerce. Went from a, a high of 5 billion cubic feet in 1900 to less than 500 uh, million acres in 1970 when they stopped keeping the records because they weren't crucial to the economy. So when you, there was this great uh, New York Times article, I believe it was in 1896, that talked about the, um, the increase in horses for transportation in Manhattan. And they projected the increase in population and therefore the increase in horses to transport people in the increase in the natural byproduct of horses on the streets of New York. And they projected that in just a few years, the, the average height of that natural byproduct was going to be taller than the average person. So what happened? Oh, this is at a time when the environmental technology was a bucket and a shovel, okay? So what happened? Did they ban horses? No. Technology intervened to change the equation. Uh, it changed the trajectory that we were on. You can argue about whether or not cars were the, uh, and, and, and uh, trolley cars and things were like that were the best uh, long-term solution, but science and technology intervened to change that unsustainable trajectory. So when we start looking at the great challenges of sustainability, everybody can have their own list, but certainly um, population has to be up there, right? So we're talking that, uh, let's see, since around when I was... I was born with more than doubled the population. We went from three billion to over seven, okay? Um, and the past, um, whatever, 60 years, we tripled the population. And where is that population growth happening? These are the richest nations of the world. These are the poorest nations of the world. Okay, great. So that tells us that what we have to do is increase the state of development of the poorest nations of the world. That will bring about higher quality of life, higher state of development, higher learning, follows, uh, uh, almost always follows, higher empowerment and education of women, and you bring about a stable population growth. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that historically, coupled with increase of state of development, has been increased resource depletion, environmental degradation. All right. So <clears throat> the challenge becomes, how do you increase the state of development, the quality of life, while reducing the detrimental effects, the detrimental effects of, uh, of, of this economic growth, avoiding the resource depletion? Last I checked, that's exactly what green chemistry and green engineering is all about. How you decrease the the adverse consequence, the hazard, the toxicity, the pollution, while getting higher performance. That's what we're going to be talking about this whole semester, is how do we manifest this? This is not going to be theory. We're going to be seeing countless examples of how we're achieving exactly that. So what we want to do is get uh, the higher state of development and do this kind of leapfrog technology. And we're going to talk a lot about leapfrog, and I'm going to want all of you to know about some of the leapfrog examples. Okay, um, this is one of my favorite of all of uh, uh, President Kennedy's quotes, that the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, 
deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and realistic. So there's a mythology that you can't have economic development, you can't have growth, you can't have increase in jobs, you can't have uh, uh, increased quality of life unless you're going to essentially destroy the environment, use toxic substances. Green chemistry is belying that myth every day. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these. So let's talk about uh, energy. Everybody knows, and this room knows, that the vast majority of our energy uh, in the world today is generated uh, from non-renewable sources. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So this is the projected increase in consumption of energy over time. These are the projections. And this is what is projected to be the portfolio of energy. Still oil, still natural gas, still coal. What green chemistry, green engineering, sustainable design is all about is changing that trajectory, changing that balance so that that is not uh, inevitable. All right, so it's looking at developing alternatives for energy uh, uh, generation, everything from photovoltaics, hydrogen generation, fuel cells, bio-based, um, in addition to these alternative energy sources that we're going to talk a lot about, it's also about uh, catalysis. We're going to talk about catalysis and how you can undertake transformations, for instance, of one material into another with dramatically lower energy, with dramatically lower waste, with dramatically lower material uh, consumption. Global change. All right. I hate the phrase global warming. Uh, I, I sometimes use the phrase climatic chaos because what's happening is we're, in a, uh, we're adding energy into what's largely a closed system. Um, and when you do that, some places will get warmer, some places will get colder. Some places will get wetter, some places will get drier. It's not about this, this linear uh, progression. It's about how you add turbulence into, uh, into a system and the literal definition of the word chaos. This is one of the classic uh, pieces of, of data. This shows the temperature change over the past 1,000 years. This shows the increases in carbon dioxide concentrations over the last several years. Uh, and these are the emissions over time. Okay. All right. So I'm telling you this quick story. One of the most powerful um, greenhouse gases is not... Um, is not CO2, but a lot of the uh, CFCs, the, the chlorofluorocarbons. And many of these were, uh, were used as fire extinguishing agents. Okay? This is an example of a technology, it's called pyrocool, of a fire extinguishing agent that didn't use CFCs, completely eliminated CFCs, um, and so no emissions. It basically served to make water a more effective fire extinguishing agent by using surfactants in a, in a formulation. Okay. So why do I tell you that? Because CFCs are such a big deal in fire extinguishing agents and they contribute, even though they're about 24,000 times more potent to greenhouse gas than CO2. No, that's not why I'm telling you. I'm telling you this because, one, you can use the science and technology of, of this technology to use in other applications, but more importantly, when this fire extinguishing agent was used in, a, uh, in an oil tanker fire in the Bosphorus Straits, Lloyds of London uh, estimated that this would take uh, 10 days to put out, and this fire extinguishing agent put it out in 12 and a half minutes. So what does that mean? Come back to JFK. The great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie. It's the myth. The myth is the green products are not going to work as well. That if you're going to get environmental benefit, if you're not going to have environmental degradation, you're not going to get the performance and the function that you want. I am going to show you, you're going to discover, you're going to research examples over and over again that are more functional, higher performance, and uh, environmentally beneficial and sustainable. So how do we change the equation? It's not about just CFCs or... Uh, or the, or the like, how do we make greenhouse gases so that they're actually um, uh, functional? 
uh, how do we take CO2 and, and build it into our polymers and plastics? It's being done. Brilliant work by uh, a company founded by Professor Jeff, Jeff Coates and Cornell, making new plastics using CO2. All right. So we know that we have a resource depletion issue, uh, that we've talked about that. We know that we, we're burning a lot of our natural capital, uh, like it's a fire sale. How do we, what green chemistry is doing, is how do we use biomass? How do we use um, nanoscience so that we get the, the function that we want with dramatically less material? How do we go to carry out transformations with visible light rather than chemicals and material? How do we use carbon dioxide as a feedstock rather than as a waste? Remember, when is a waste not a waste? When it's a value-added material. All a waste is, is a material or energy for which you have not found a valuable endpoint. And chitin, which is a biopolymer or waste utilization. All right, I'm gonna be wrapping up talking about um, food supply. We actually produce enough food. There's inequitable distribution so there's still regional star starvation, which is tragic. But if you take a look at the Green Revolution that I talked about by Norm Bollock, this is the development since 1960 of food production. Absolutely astounding. Good food production in developing countries um, and industrialized nations both. You have to ask the question, how did it happen? That's part of how it happened? That's part of how it happened. So how do we get that important performance, producing food, feeding hungry bellies, but not doing it in a way that's, that's contaminating our drinking water, building up in our bodies? Uh, and that's what green chemistry is developing. New pesticides, which are only focused on the target pest and not all of the uh, other beneficial uh, insects. Think fertilizer and fer fertilizer adjuvants that draw the fertilizers to the roots so that you don't put 10 times the amount of fertilizer so that you wind up having it get into your drinking water, but you only put down what is actually going to be uh, taken up by the, um, by the plant. Methods of using agricultural wastes for beneficial and profitable uses. So one of the key areas that we're going to talk about is um, toxics in the environment, toxics in our body, and this is a, one of the great strengths of how you decouple the adverse consequences of, uh, of chemicals from the performance that we talked about. As you all know, I'm a chemist. I love chemistry. I love chemicals. I hate hazard. I hate unsustainability. And I am going to be the last one that will ever say, we ought to stop using chemicals. What we need is things that are chemical free. I find that very silly. Uh, we just discussed that everything's a chemical. The reason that I've, and on a personal note, have devoted my professional life to green chemistry is because, not because I, I hate chemistry, I dislike chemistry, it's because we can do better. That chemistry can do far better. It's transformed the world in some very positive ways, and it's transformed the world in some very consequential and adverse ways. And one of the things I know as a person who's been involved in green chemistry for a lot of years now um, is that we can get uh, the, the benefits without the adverse consequences.